Uh, and I'm very uh, uh, grateful that you all invited me to participate in uh, what I would call our mutual mission uh, with regard to stigma. And of course, my mission goes to the purpose of overcoming stigma, which is to get treatment. Uh, and trying to convince people to do that is often maybe uh, sometimes the hardest step in the entire process is getting them through the door. Uh, and I want to take you on a, a journey today and to be, get, get us sort of oriented to the issue, I'd like to show you this uh, first uh, video clip. Uh, you can hardly live in Maryland and not remember the Navy Yard shooter. So here's an interview with his sister that came out just uh, a month ago. It was September 16th of last year when Aaron Alexis went on a shooting rampage at the Washington Navy Yard. 12 people were killed and several others were wounded before officers shot the 34-year-old contract worker. His two sisters, including Naomi Alexis, heard about the shooting on the radio and had a feeling their brother was involved. Naomi believes Aaron suffered from severe mental problems that started when he was an adolescent. She says he would violently beat her when she was just 12 years old. It was unprovoked a lot of the time, and a lot of time it was just over silly things. Like, I spoke while he was on the phone, so he would, you know, punch me in the face. When he was a teenager, she says he'd lock himself in his room blasting music for hours. Then came stories of torturing pets. Over the years, Naomi told her family he needed to see a doctor. I would have violent, like, tearful outbursts and try to get my mom to be like, this is not right, there's something you can, there's something, there's nothing, this is, this is not supposed to be this way. But Aaron's actions were something the family just didn't discuss. And do you think that perhaps there was a sense of shame? I think absolutely there was a sense of shame. and. Or just, or maybe helplessness, like they didn't know what to do. They didn't know how to address the situation without, you know, labeling my brother mentally ill. Naomi is telling her story, hoping families who have similar problems will call the National Alliance on Mental Illness to get help for their loved ones. She's also hoping to write a book about her experience, hoping her family's story will help others. So we didn't know what to do without labeling our brother mentally ill, which is of course is exactly what he was. And as if the label itself, which could actually help uh, in, in the end, uh, was an obstruction. So here's our agenda today. I'm going to give you some uh, introductory remarks about how common and widespread it is to the difficulty of convincing people to get treatment. What are some of the reasons why you would want to get treatment, some common consequences. Uh, the value of early intervention uh, and getting in there as soon as you can. And of course, why in the world do we have to have a lecture like this? You don't usually have lectures about how to convince your loved one to see an orthopedic uh, or a cardiologist. Uh, why are we having this? Why do you even need a book like the one that I wrote? Uh, why are people so reluctant? And then I'm going to give you some ideas that come from this uh, book that I wrote that uh, are practical tips about how you might be able to work with somebody you care about to convince them to get into treatment in a variety of circumstances. So here are a couple of scenarios. Imagine this, a close friend of yours is acting strangely. You and she have a long-standing lunch date every other Tuesday, but lately she's been canceling at the last minute. When you call her at the office, the receptionist tells you she's not in. You ran into her husband at the grocery store and he told you that she hasn't been sleeping well, she's been missing days at work, you don't know whether she's lost interest in your friendship, whether she's having some kind of an affair or what, or whether she's having emotional problems and needs help. Do you talk to her? Do you approach her? Do you just let it go? Uh, and if you do talk to her, what do you say? Another scenario, your brother called and suggested you keep your living room curtains closed because they might be watching. Who's watching, you ask him? The people in red cars, I saw three of them on my way home today, they all had license plates beginning with the number three. I think they're watching people who have three kids, like you. This conversation only adds to the worries you've had about him, like noticing that he isn't changing clothes very much and it seems to be a long time since he took a shower. At the last family dinner with your parents, he came late, seemed very uncomfortable, and left abruptly. He is definitely not himself, at least the self that you used to know. Do you approach this? If so, how? 
All right, so we all know the statistic from the Centers for Disease Control. Uh, I'm on the board of directors of the Maryland Foundation for Psychiatry. We have put up these signs at uh, uh, bus stops and subway stops all over Baltimore. It says one in four friends suffer from it. Mental illness is more normal than you think. Uh, the Centers for Disease Control reminds us, even in children, uh, that there is indeed uh, about one in, as many as one in five kids have a clinically significant problem in the domain of thoughts, feelings, and behavior. That's the domain of mental life, and those rates are increasing. But reluctance uh, is very common in terms of getting people to seek treatment. And why is that? So this was a very well-developed uh, study. The National Comorbidity Service in the early 2000s, they interviewed nearly 10,000 people. Uh, and uh, specifically, 40% uh, of those people uh, who had a diagnosable mental, mental disorder never received any professional help. So the question is why? And the number one reason was they asked them some, you know, multiple choice questions, and the number one reason was, I didn't think I really needed it, except that the clinicians who were doing the survey felt they really did need it. So it really shows that about uh, four out of 10 people, two-fifths of people, uh, who clearly could use help never show up for it, which is almost half. So who can help them? And I submit to you that the power of families, the power of friendships, uh, are, is far more significant in being able to get this job done than the power of doctors, the power of police, the power of authorities. Uh, and it really has become one of my great interests in empowering people to be able to help those loved ones who are troubled in their lives uh, be able to get state-of-the-art evaluation and treatment for that. So uh, here's uh, a study that in 2005 that looked at about 1,000 people, and they asked them, to whom would you turn for emotional help uh, if you had uh, mental or emotional problems? And the results of this survey is that basically 20% uh, would ask no, for no help, uh, about 17% would ask a professional, but the vast majority would turn to a family or friend. So family members, friends are the first line, uh, the first line of help, uh, the first responders, if you will, and that was a theme yesterday at some of the first responder seminars uh, that were put on here. So this uh, trope about the reluctance to seek help is very widespread and uh, one of the other things that I do in my career is I consult to Hollywood and I consult to TV and have done a lot of work with trying to get the depictions both of mental illness and those who treat them uh, to be more accurate in television and the movies. So I pay a lot of attention to these things and movies as a reflection of society certainly illustrate this uh, phenomenon that people are reluctant to see seek help. I wanna give you a couple of examples. Uh, the first, how many people saw this old movie, Ordinary People? Uh, it's from years ago, so here's a script. Beth, Dr. Berger, the psychiatrist. I think we could all go and see him together. What does he know about me, about this family? I've never even met him. Exactly, that's the point. Wouldn't it be easier if we all talked about it in the open? About what? What are we going to talk about? I don't want to see any doctor or counselors. I am me. This is my family, and if we have problems, then we will solve those problems in the privacy of our own home, not by running to some kind of specialist every time something goes wrong. Uh, I think many people can identify with that. Uh, by the way, that was read by my son, who is uh, just about to go off to study acting in college <laughs> next year. Breaking Bad, how many people saw this series? Uh, this is probably the number one most watched show in the history of television. So the fellow on the left uh, has been through some horrendous traumas. He's, these are two police officers. Uh, and he's seen people killed and his friends killed. And he is clearly, it does not take an MD or PhD to see that he's spiraling into the rabbit hole of post-traumatic stress disorder. So his partner tries to approach him to see if he can convince him to maybe get some help. 
If you're not sufficiently stimulated by this investigation, do us both a favor and ask for transfer. What is up with you lately? Starting bar fights? Turning down El Paso? And now this bullshit? Do you need to talk to someone or what? Talk to someone? Talk to who? I'm not trying to step on your toes, bro, okay? I'm just worried about you. That's all. Appreciate that, bro. I take your hand off my shoulder. Talk about the proverbial cold shoulder. <laughs> How many of you have been watching House of Cards uh, on Netflix? So uh, these, these, this is a conversation between the uh, first lady on the left, president of the United States wife, and the wife of the vice president on the right. I'm not sure if Garrett will get involved publicly. Well, can you talk to him? We haven't been doing much talking about anything lately. Things haven't gotten any better? We haven't said a word to each other in almost a week. Oh, I've been there. It's awful. With Frank? Sure. What did you do? We saw someone. You mean a therapist? Weren't you worried about exposure? He was a minister. He wasn't exactly a therapist. It was more like a spiritual guidance type thing. The only difference was he had a degree. I could put you in touch. It's too risky. Somehow, it may be a little more acceptable if you see a spiritual counselor uh, who has a degree. And of course, pastoral counseling is a very legitimate entree into mental health. But even then, they're fudging. A little bit. All right, so if somebody is reluctant, why should you help? Why is it important and vital to persist? Well, uh, I think maybe uh, many people in this room really know a lot about this, but it never hurts to review and to maybe even put some more concrete facts and figures in what are the consequences of untreated mental disorders. So Sigmund Freud, he was good for a few things, uh, said something that I think most mental health professionals still abide by which is the definition of mental health. Uh, he said the ability to love and work is what it means to be healthy. In other words, he was very interested, as uh, are we today, in functioning. Uh, and as a matter of fact, if you look in the diagnostic manual, the so-called DSM of all the psychiatric disorders, whatever the various criteria are for the different disorders, one always includes and these symptoms interfere with the ability to work or go to school or to function in family responsibilities. So functional impairment is very important. So the common consequences are in the domain of love and work. In the domain of love, uh, we see the erosion of relationships and families and tremendous stresses, breakups, divorces, parental alienation. I mean, this is just a short list of the things that I've seen in my almost 30-year career in psychiatry in terms of the ravages of untreated mental illness. And in work, under functioning, losses of dropping out of school and jobs, I see many, many people who uh, could not complete their college education, uh, college education. When I see young people who often have the onset of their illness in college, it is absolutely a rehabilitation goal of mine to try to get them back to school eventually. That's a very important critical thing. And in the old days, the old days when I first got into this, we used to think that if somebody had a major mental illness that onset in college, there was no way they could go back. It's over. Uh, there's a great deal of data today to show that is absolutely not true with contemporary treatment. Um, and of course, financial instability and so forth. Uh, ultimately, uh, the uh, National Institute and Physical Health. The National Institute of uh, Mental Health estimates that mental illness costs uh, close to $200 million a year uh, in uh, financial consequences, lost productivity, and health problems. Let me just show you one aspect of a health problem. So uh, on going in this direction are increasing levels of depression using a depression rating scale, so-called uh, Hamilton depression, uh, I'm sorry, the Beck scale. And going up 
is the risk of dying after you've had a heart attack within five years of that heart attack. So if you note in the last column uh, that people with high depression ratings uh, scores at the time of their heart attack uh, are almost <clears throat> over three times more likely to be dead within five years of a heart attack. Depression is the number one risk for eventual mortality after a heart attack. It's also an independent risk factor, by the way, to get arteriosclerosis, the very thing that causes heart attacks, hardening of the arteries. So we now, people worry about high blood pressure and smoking, diabetes, all the usual risk factors for heart disease. It turns out that depression is, in fact, as robust a contributor to the risk of heart disease and if you get uh, a myocardial infarction, a heart attack, the risk of dying from it within five years, as m important robust a factor as any of those more traditional factors that one hears about. So we're also talking about risks for physical health, not just uh, love and work. Of course, they're the most uncommon but nevertheless deadly consequences, which are awful, although they do tend to bring up attention uh, to this uh, issue, unfortunately, they often result in rather hasty solutions. Uh, <clears throat> some of you uh, who live in the Maryland area may remember the Columbia Mall shooting. Uh, and uh, this young man, Darian Aguilar, actually had been to his primary care doc uh, uh, several weeks uh, before the shooting and was noted to have psychiatric symptoms, actually being uh, hearing voices. Uh, and unfortunately, that primary care doc, though, made a, a mild suggestion <clears throat> that he go into the that, that he see a psychiatrist. That suggestion was not fulfilled, nor did he make the suggestion to the young man's mother, mistakenly interpreting HIPAA as inhibiting him. If you're interested in that, I'd be glad to talk more about that this afternoon. For those of you who come to my Ask the Doctor, uh, it turns out that the ability to have communication between doctors and family members is much easier uh, than many misinterpretations of HIPAA. In fact, HIPAA in many ways makes it easier than it used to be. It's a different topic. We can talk about that this afternoon. Um, so we all know that the majority of violence in this world, in this country, is not committed by individuals who have a mental illness. Uh, but uh, those who do commit acts of significant violence are almost entirely untreated. Uh, so it's a phenomenon that is associated with lack of treatment. And when they are violent, they tend to be violent towards family members. Here is a particularly heinous example. Uh, the uh, Strack family uh, in Utah in which uh, two mentally ill parents ended up murdering all of their children. These are, of course, the most extreme examples. But it, and it turns out that when there's family-on-family -family murder, those situations, almost 70% of the time, those situations involve mental illness. And you can see who the victim is and who the, the untreated mentally ill person is. Uh, and this uh, category of a mentally ill parent killing a child or the Strax, uh, the uh, mentally ill child killing the parent, uh, of course, is Nancy Lanza of uh, Adam Lanza and the Sandy Hook shootings. So this is one of our sponsors today, the Jesse Klump Memorial Fund and Foundation. Very grateful to them for facilitating this, met some of the folks involved with them and all the allied agencies last night at dinner. Had a, a wonderful gathering last night. So this slide is to remind me uh, it's now time to talk about a more common dreaded outcome of untreated mental illness, and that is suicide. And everybody's always worried about homicide and what's the homicide rate and what's the murder. This shows you every state in the union, including Puerto Rico, uh, and the uh, I don't know if you can see it in the back of the room, the homicide rates are in red and the suicide rates are in blue. And in every state, with the exception of D.C., uh, Louisiana, and Puerto Rico, the suicide rates greatly outnumber, outweigh the homicide rates at a, somewhere between three and ten times. So the problem in this country is not, I mean, even take mental illness out of the equation, just talking about human beings who die unnecessarily at the hands of other human beings. 
dying by your own hand is a far bigger public health problem in this country than dying by the hand of someone else. Uh, suicidal thinking is very common. Uh, about 4% of the population has serious thoughts of suicide uh, one time in their life. About 1% uh, make uh, suicide plans at a certain point. If you look at the youth, 18 to 25, 7% have serious thoughts of suicide and 2% make an attempt. So, you know, we're, we're not talking about everybody is so interested in things like ALS, for example. Uh, and there's a whole thing going on, the internet ALS, and of course the uh, uh, Stephen Hawking movie uh, has gotten everybody interested in ALS. Uh, these rates are 100 to 500 times as common as ALS. 15% of those plans uh, will actually morph into attempts if untreated. Top causes of death in the United States, suicide is the number four cause of death. For every person who has cancer, right, every six people who have cancer and dies from it, one person dies from suicide. Rate of death from suicide is higher than diabetes. It's higher than stroke. These everyday things that everybody, oh, my blood pressure, I don't want to have a stroke. I uh, need to take my blood pressure medication. Your risk of dying from a stroke is less. It's about uh, three quarters the risk of dying from suicide. A few words about guns, because these tend to get mental illness into the news. Don't worry about all this detail. These are uh, a conglomeration of studies. Uh, which together, bottom line, show that if there's a firearm in a home, the chance of homicide occurring in that home is about twice as common as homes that don't have a gun. The chance of suicide in that home is over three times. So the real story of guns in our society, uh, the big story of guns, is suicide. The smaller story of guns is homicide. Uh, if you look at suicides by methods, about 55% of suicides are by firearms, but they are far and away the most successful method. 80% success. Everybody's thinking about overdosing, overdosing, overdosing. Well, actually, only about 17% of people overdose, and of those people who do, only 2% are successful. It's a very unsuccessful method. So, Here's something, if you remember one thing from today, one thing I want you to remember, two out of three people who die at the business end of a gun in this country, it's their own finger on the trigger. Two out of three people who die by gunshot, they, put, they shot themselves, deliberately. Accidental gunshot deaths are actually very rare. That's a really a staggering statistic. So in my mind, certainly as a psychiatrist, we all have our own points of departure. That's the real story about guns that we need to be focusing on as a society. All right, so we want to make early interventions. We want to be able to head off some of these dire consequences. Uh, uh, my cousin is a dermatologist. He sent me this. I'm going to show it to you, but I'm going to show it to you very briefly uh, because my wife is here and my ha wife hates to see this slide. But this is uh, a lesion on the thumb of a patient of his, uh, and it's one centimeter. He saw the patient in his office, and he said, you really need to come in next week, and I'm going to biopsy it. The patient didn't return for two and a half years. When he returned two and a half years later, this is what it looked like. That's enough. But just as grotesque and heinous is these cute kids, these wonderful adol or adolescents, uh, look who they grew up to be. You see the analogy. So we have come to recognize a phenomenon in uh, mental illness called kindling. And it comes from the word that we use uh, for fires. 
when a fire begins, it's a lot easier to put out when it just starts, you know, before the drapes catch on fire, before the wallpaper catches on fire. Uh, that's called kindling. We know that uh, uh, some of the major mental illnesses, in particular schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, unipolar depression, bipolar depression, and obsessive compulsive disorder, early intervention can change the whole life course of the lifetime of the disease. Uh, because what happens if you don't treat this disorder, here this is an example for bipolar disorder, uh, the more it goes untreated with the relapses that you get with that disorder, it becomes quicker and quicker. Shorter intervals between relapses, each relapse becomes increasingly severe over time and therefore more resistant to medication. Uh, it's the people who come in, which by the way, the average time for the diagnosis from the onset of symptoms to actually getting treatment for bipolar disorder is six and a half years, not six and a half months, six and a half years, uh, because the vast majority of people who have bipolar disorder aren't severe enough to be hospitalized and voluntarily hospitalized. And those are the people, six and a half years, they're all kindled up. Those are the people who are getting the multiple complex medication cocktails because simple lithium prescription is just not enough at that stage of kindling. Uh, and as the illness kindles and gets worse and worse, you get increasing disability uh, and dysfunction from that illness. So early intervention not only can uh, uh, deal with that particular episode, but can actually abort kindling and change the rest of a person's life. That's why it's so important for you, all of us, to get those people we care about into treatment uh, as soon as possible. So why is it so hard? Why are people reluctant? Well, our topic today, which I'm, I, you, you'll hear mo far more from other people, of course, is stigma. Uh, this uh, uh, from Norman Dane at Rutgers said, the traditional belief that madness is often a punishment visited by God on a sinner predominated in American society during the 17th century and remained quite influential thereafter. That is still the long-standing legacy, even in a more secular society. Uh, the residuum, the long shadow of, remember this was a country founded religiously and in Puritan ideals, <laughs> that there's something uh, that is morally wrong or weak uh, is still an embedded idea. Um, I would like to tell you that we've made a huge amount of progress in stigma. So uh, here is a, a survey uh, between 1996 and 2008. Uh, they asked the question at those two years, uh, do you think that mental illness is just caused by bad character? No progress in 10 years. Do you think it was caused by the way someone's raised, bad parenting, no progress in 10 years? Would you be willing to be a neighbor of somebody who had mental illness, no progress in 10 years? Would you be willing to be a friend to somebody who had mental illness, no progress? Would you be willing to marry into the family or have your kid marry into a family uh, where there is a significant history of mental illness, no progress? The only ones, uh, areas in which there have been progress is the general understanding that these things may have something to do with the chemical imbalance or may be related to genetics. Those are two areas where we have made progress. So, you know, these things are evolutionary, not revolutionary, but it's going at a glacial pace, ladies and gentlemen. Here's one of the earliest anti-stigma voices, Abraham Lincoln, who famously said, a tendency to melancholy is a misfortune, not a fault. Uh, he, of course, had melancholy, which we would call now recurrent unipolar depression. Uh, somehow he was able to function well enough to be president of the United States. The Nike myth, the just do it myth, or the just say no slogan uh, of Betty Ford. Uh, we live in a culture that very much believes in the power of self-determination, uh, the individual will, the power of will uh, to overcome and the idea that you can just will yourself forward is a very deeply embedded 
idea. By the way, it's one of the ideas which uh, any of you who have been involved with the 12-step world has really done a tremendous job confronting. Those of you who know the 12 steps remember the first step, which I think is the magic step, frankly. That's, uh, all the rest is footnotes. The first step came to admit we were powerless and our lives became unmanageable because of whatever it is we're here talking about. Powerlessness that I threw my will at this. I did everything. I squeezed that sponge of my will uh, as hard as I possibly could and I still couldn't overcome the problem. So there's got to be more than just will. And the program goes on, you know, higher power, whether it's a spiritual idea or the power of being here in this group or the power of medication and treatment, all sorts of powers that, are, that go beyond will because there's certainly things in this life that trump will. And that's spooky. That's spooky, especially in Western culture, especially in American culture. It's one of the very important reasons. I'm not showing you a comprehensive list, just I think some of the most important ones, why people are not showing up for treatment and why we need to have discussions like this. Many of you uh, may have uh, personal or family experience with this one. Uh, anos agnosia, some illnesses. After all, it is the brain that we use to self-reflect and to observe ourselves. So, perhaps it's no surprise that if there are illnesses that affect the functioning of the brain, that something that might occur occasionally is the inability to see that one is ill. Hence this fancy Greek term, it's a good Scrabble word if you have all the le letters, although I don't think it's seven letters, it's beyond seven letters. So, anos agnosia, which literally means no knowledge of the self, self-blindness. And I show you these interesting uh, brain scans looking at uh, brain activity on, on fMRI and on the left uh, is somebody who has anos agnosia, a person with schizophrenia who does not think that they're ill at all, does not think there's, there's anything that has to do with mental illness to, uh, that uh, is related to the fact that they hear a voice coming out of that chandelier telling them that they're being watched by the government. Uh, even though to all of us it may seem pretty self-evident, uh, that that could really possibly be something that's originating inside the mind, inside the brain. A uh, person does not think that's true at all. They think, of course, that's the government watching me. So on the left is somebody uh, with schizophrenia who has anosognosia, and on the right is someone with schizophrenia who would say, yeah, that's a hallucination. I'm having a hallucination. That's my, my illness. It's, that's my own mind, you know, making it sound as if it's like I'm having a dream while I'm awake. Uh, I don't wake up in the morning after a dream and say, oh my gosh, I entered an alternate universe. I wake up after a dream and I say, wow, isn't the mind an amazing thing? What it generated in my sleep last night. So that's the person on the right. And you can see that there are certain areas that light up in the brain on the right that are not lighting up on the left. Uh, so anos agnosia. Um, Javier Amador, uh, many of you are familiar with this book, I'm not sick, I don't need help. His book is really related to this end of the spectrum, how to work with people, and that has a whole institute. Uh, I'm uh, flattered that NAMI is beginning to call his book and my book the two bookends of NAMI. Uh, you need help and I don't need help, the two bookends. And together I think we, we cover a lot of territory. Uh, a lot of misinformation about psychiatry. A lot of psychiatry is bull. Uh, my, uh, uh, in my first marriage, my father-in-law, uh, when he met me and said, uh, found out I was a psychiatrist, said, oh man, anybody who needs to see a psychiatrist needs to see a psychiatrist. It's <laughs> probably why I'm not married anymore to her. <laughs> Moved on. <laughs> a lot of misinformation. This is from a website by this guy, John Rappaport. Uh, who claims, anyway, uh, that he was on the short list for the Nobel Prize, I don't know what for. Don't let your child see a psychiatrist ever, ever. Um, by the way, this book came out this week, uh, and I'm devouring it. Uh, this is uh, by the chairman of psychiatry at Columbia University, who is just the immediate past president of the American Psychiatric Association, shrinks the untold story of psychiatry a fascinating exploration as to how in the world psychiatry came out uh, about uh, with having this kind of reputation that indeed there have been many 
dead ends and weird things in the history of psychiatry. So to some extent, it's understandable where these things come from. But in the midst of all that, there's been a golden thread of science, evidence-based, and the evolution of a real state-of-the-art specialty amidst all of that noise. Uh, it's a, a wonderful book, uh, Correcting This Information. The Woody Allen syndrome. Woody Allen, who seems to have been in treatment uh, since he was born uh, and continues to be. Uh, we live in a culture which I call the culture of the Maalox moment. Some of you may be old enough to remember the old Maalox commercials. Right? You have heartburn, you take Maalox, you're better in a Maalox moment, 15 seconds. Short attention span culture, we expect things to be done quickly and there's uh, uh, certain stereotypes out there that uh, things cannot be helped quickly and things can't be helped at all and people just go around and around and around in circles in treatment. Uh, Woody Allen is certainly the iconic representation of that. Uh, difficulty getting an appointment. It's another reason. Uh, here's a study where they uh, called 360 psychiatrists in Boston, Houston, and Chicago trying to get an appointment. They were only able to get an appointment with 26 percent of the people they called in this study, 26%. And a number of them didn't even call back, which is actually absolutely inexcusable. The interesting thing is that the ability to get an appointment had nothing to do, the surrogates who were making the call, some of them said, I'm willing to pay you out of pocket, your full fee. Some of them said, I have Medicare. Some of them said, I have Blue Cross. Some of them, I, had, uh, I have Medicaid. It made no difference. It has nothing to do with, with how much money you want to pay. There's no difference in the group that said we want to pay you full price. There's just not enough manpower. Uh, particularly in psychiatry, we currently estimate in the United States we have about 69% of the psychiatrists that we need. By 2020, we're estimated to have 54% of the psychiatrists we need. We have an aging workforce. Students aren't going into psychiatry for, for many reasons, one of which uh, I want to uh, show you now. So uh, we have this interesting finding uh, that just came out last year. These are all the different specialists, the percent of specialists who take insurance. And you see way down at the bottom, the last one uh, is psychiatry in which 53% of psychiatrists take insurance uh, as opposed to 95% of cardiologists. Uh, so why is this phenomenon happening? Well, I want to show you some interesting numbers, uh, this kind of public information. A lot of these insurance reimbursement things uh, are secret to the insurance company. Uh, but here's some data on Medicare, for example. All right. This is what Medicare pays the doctor, not the facility, the doctor. A 20-minute colonoscopy, for 20 minutes of work, the doctor will get $350. For 20 minutes of a psychiatric med check, the doctor will get between $60 and $90. That's one-fifth of the colonoscopist. For a 60-minute psychotherapy session, uh, Medicare will pay $90. That's about one-quarter of what they... Meanwhile, the colonoscopist has done three cases uh, in that 60 minutes. Do you understand why it's difficult recruiting people to, into psychiatry? You have to be an idealist to go into psychiatry. And one of, the, one of the reasons I'm an idealist and I was very inspired by all of the idealists and you know, socially conscious people that I saw in psychiatry. Uh, now, what about just primary care? This is Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield of Virginia. I was able to get that in terms of how much they pay for an hour of a primary care doc services compared to an hour of a psychiatrist services three times. If I'm a family doctor, I will get paid three times as much to sit with a patient for an hour. Not that they sit with patients for an hour, uh, but if they have to, as sometimes they do, that will be triple the reimbursement from Blue Cross in Northern Virginia uh, than if you sit an hour with psychiatrists. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is one of the reasons why psychiatrists have stopped taking insurance. Now, you know, that creates certain financial barriers. Uh, as Marge Simpson tells us. <gasps> I never even realize. I'm so sorry. Marge, I want you to admit you have a gambling problem. You know, you're right, Homer. 
Maybe I should get some professional help. No, no, that's too expensive. Just don't do it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so here's another survey by SAMHSA. The top reasons why people have not received treatment in the last year. Uh, and the number one reason, 50%, far outweighing, is that you could not afford the cost. So, you know, what's to be done about this? So now we have Obamacare and parity with all of its promises that every policy, it's an essential benefit to governmental illness, the limits must be entirely the same, that you can't de uh, deny for pre-existing conditions or give higher premiums. So it all sounds great. One of the things that's still not clear is if a psychiatrist and a dermatologist build the exact same code, we can build the exact same code, is the dermatologist and the psychiatrist going to get paid the same amount? And I will tell you, ladies and gentlemen, if the answer is no, and it is no now. Currently, actually, the US Department of Labor just published last week, I wasn't able to get it in time for this talk, finding showing no. A dermatologist who builds a CPT code, some of you are clinicians, would understand this, 99214, and the psychiatrist bills the CPT code 99214, the so-called E&M codes, the dermatologist gets paid 70% more than the psychiatrist, exact same code. So how parity is going to end up playing out and fleshed out remains to be seen. But I just want you all to hear about this particular issue that's a block to treatment from the point of view of a psychiatrist. Uh, these are real concerns. All right, so you all remember Frazier. Uh, so I was Frazier, I still am sometimes. Uh, throughout the 90s, I had a radio show that went coast to coast called Comrade on Call. Um, and then I did an NPR show for some years called Sunday Rounds. And now I'm a regular guest. For those of you who live in the Maryland, Delaware area, you may hear the Dan Roderick show on WYPR. And Dan and I do uh, a periodic hour together uh, on his show with, that we call Midday on the Mind. So in doing all this radio work, uh, the most popular hour was not when I interviewed other experts, but when I had open phones. Uh, and this is the most common question I would get on open phones. My relative, my brother, my sister, my husband, my grandmother, my uh, teenager is having some kind of emotional problem, and it's beyond my ability to help. How can I convince him or her to see a doctor like you? a professional to get professional help. So I began brainstorming that uh, several hundred times uh, on the air with people and uh, ultimately developed a line of specialty in my own practice uh, in people coming to consult me to brainstorm about how to do that. Uh, and uh, after 15 years of doing that, I put everything I learned uh, in doing that into this book. So uh, Rosalind Carter, uh, former first lady, has devoted her career. She wrote the uh, foreword to the book. And she's done, you know, she is in the tradition of Lincoln, uh, a modern ver voice against stigma. She's written a number of books uh, on the issue of mental illness, mental health access, advocacy. This is her life's work. Uh, she holds every year at the Carter Center. I've been privileged to be part of this for the last few years, a conference with uh, a lot of the leaders of uh, American healthcare and policy, it's more of a policy conference, uh, looking at the issue of stigma, mental health access. Each year is kind of a different special topic in that domain down at the, Car the Carter Center. Uh, and the book has a variety of chapters, a number of background chapters, and then uh, some chapters that are very practical. And I'm going to give you some samples from some of these ideas now how to choose the right time and place, how to make your first approach, working with allies, and the heart and soul of the book, which is moving from persuasion to coercion, uh, something which uh, I make no bones about using that word. We're going to talk about that in a minute. How to play hardball, which is all about some tips and uh, uh, experiences and some ways to maximize the value of using the involuntary treatment system, when to use it, how to use it, how to get the best possible outcome, and how to continue your support uh, when you actually get that evaluation. The entire um, goal of this book is one and only one thing, to get a proper state-of-the-art evaluation. 
Uh, when you've got that evaluation done, this book has done its job. Uh, its work is done. Then when you find out what's going on, then you get somebody else's book. How to help someone with depression, how to help someone with alcoholism, how to help someone with schizophrenia. E. Fuller Torrey has written a couple of good ones in that regard. So the goal is getting them through the door for an evaluation. You know, yesterday there was a seminar uh, here that uh, we did about safe talk and mental health first aid. These are like CPR. These are first response things. But the purpose of a first response is to get somebody to state-of-the-art 21st century treatment, right? CPR, your work is not done. CPR is getting them alive, keeping them alive till the ambulance comes and actually gets them to the hospital, okay? So we want to, what I'm taking from is building on yesterday's work, I now want to take you further to get into a place where you can answer the question, what is going on here? Many people think the word diagnosis is a dirty word, a label. The fact of the matter, all the way back with Hippocrates, the father of medicine, uh, over 2,000 years ago, said diagnosis is half the cure. Why? Because diagnosis answers the question, what to do about it. Diagnosis leads to two very important things. Uh, one is treatment. You know, what do we know about this? What can we do about it? And of course, the other thing that I think is one of the most important functions of a doctor uh, is prognosis. What's going to happen? What can we expect? What can we expect without the treatment? What can we expect with the treatment? Uh, and this is the way medicine works. This is, a, you know, the 2,500-year-old tradition of how to think through systematically the way in which human beings go off wire, whether it's in the brain or any other organ. And this is what directs science, so that you can ask systematic questions uh, to get answers to uh, find out what works and what doesn't work. All right, so when is it time? When is it time for professional help? Uh, back to The Simpsons, my son's favorite, favorite show. So here's Apu on the roof. and. Maybe they're thinking, this person needs more help than I know how to give, or I need some professional advice about how to handle this. We're not sure he's going to be OK. So when is it enough to just have a caring friend or a good hairdresser? Or when is it time to actually seek some professional help? So here are some signs. I think I don't need to go through them. Many of you are already familiar with this. These are a conglomeration of the from the American Psychiatric Association, the Department of Health and Human Services, and the World Health Organization about some common major symptoms that really rise to the level of clinical significance, where you really do have to start thinking systematically about what's going on. And remember, uh, the bottom line is functioning, functioning, as we talked about before. But I, I want to tell you that a very important thing that we tend to think about in psychiatry is this concept of a change from baseline that generally, you know, most illnesses have an onset. And they have a premorbid period where people are well, and then they begin to go off wire. So identifying when a person is not themselves, is not the way they've been for a long time, is a particularly important concept to be keeping in mind about when we're maybe dealing with a situation that is a health problem, a mental health problem. Uh, here's a particularly uh, unfortunate example. Some of you may remember this. Back in 2007, the famous astronaut, Lisa Nowak, he, she was a naval officer and one of the first women astronauts, incredibly high powered. And she fell off the baseline. She began to, to develop a number of signs and symptoms that ultimately resulted in her taking a three-day drive with no sleep, uh, with knives and poison and duct tape and no showering to go and uh, kidnap uh, a jilted lover that she had. And she was arrested uh, and she pled insanity appropriately uh, in my uh, estimation and was actually found not guilty by reason of insanity. Big change from baseline, from the left when she's in the astronaut program to the right, her picture on the day she was arrested. Uh, this is not a well woman. This is a change from baseline. All right. Let's get started with some practical uh, things that I'd like to share with you. 
Uh, first, is I'd like to talk a little bit about when you want to talk with somebody about convincing them to get an evaluation, you've got to pick the right time uh, and the right place. So first, I you know, want to just be sure that you don't pick the wrong time. Here are some wrong times. It's not a good time to discuss this in the middle of the night. It's not a good time to discuss this uh, uh, when people are not at their best, uh, to not come at them from a side swipe when defenses are down, when they're intoxicated, uh, when they're at family events, when everybody's trying to look good and compete in their images. This is, even though it may be convenient because this is when you tend to see loved ones. Uh, certainly not in the midst of an argument, when you may especially be likely to yell epithets like you're sick, you're crazy, definitely words you don't want to use, we'll see in a moment. And I think these are face-to-face -face conversations despite the glories of new technology for communication, not email, text, certainly Facebook where all the friends can read about it, uh, or even written mail. Uh, these are conversations for face-to-face. -face. So I think that these conversations benefit from preparing the way uh, to be able to say there's something very important that I really would like to talk about you and I want to talk about that because I love you because love is a very important medically active ingredient in these conversations, an ingredient that you all can deploy that a doctor really can't deploy, at least not explicitly, with patients. Uh, so, uh, and to say, look, tomorrow night, I'd like to be able to have an important conversation with you. Contrary to popular belief, there's a lot of evidence that that expectation set does not cause people to run away and get more uh, uh, panicked it actually causes them to become more oriented. It makes the matter what we call salient, extremely relevant. They actually become much more attentive. So, uh, and to be able to say, and you can also disabuse them. I'm not gonna talk about anything scary that you know, you're not in any trouble. I'm gonna talk about something that's very serious, but it's something that I wanna talk to you about because I want to be able to help you and love you better. Uh, finding a place that's emotionally neutral is very important. Uh, I probably wouldn't take uh, an adult sibling uh, back into the childhood bedroom at your parents' house. I think that's too emotionally evocative. If it's unsafe, you definitely want to maybe have this conversation in a cafe <laughs> somewhere where you can speak in low voices. But uh, if you feel that the reaction is going to be a dangerous one, uh, probably not in private. So we want the picture on the left, not the picture on the right. Uh, and that the goal, the goal is very simply to get them in the door uh, for a professional evaluation. So uh, I think it's important in these conversations, and by the way, at this point, at this point we're talking about people you can reason with. We're gonna get to the people you can't reason with in a moment. Uh, but you can see that somebody who is still possessed of reason, possessed of the ability to understand and reflect, might be able to participate in some of these kinds of approaches. It's important to acknowledge that this is uncomfortable. This is not, you know, I, I really understand that, that what we're talking about here isn't easy. And it's not easy for you, it's not easy for me, but it is important. Uh, again, this is about the relationship. These conversations are in the context of a relationship. You're not you know, a judge who's appearing in court, stranger. This is a relationship. So, and the point is, in, in doing this, is to be able to make it clear, I'm, I'm wa wanting to approach you about the, this matter because our relationship is important to me, important to me, and I want to be able to approach this in a way that doesn't endanger our relationship. That is really important to me. Uh, so you're not rejecting them by that, in giving that message. And we talked about deploying the theme of love and concern up front. Talking a lot about your own feelings. I'm worried about you. I'm scared. It's really, really uh, unnerving for the kids and me when you stand at the sink for three hours drying the dishes. That, that's really, really difficult for us. I can't sleep at night because I'm up so worried about your drinking. I am starting to get myself very depressed over the fact that you keep missing days at work and I worry about 
our financial future. So talking about your own feelings is an important point, point of departure. And if you noticed in what I just said, specific identification of very specific symptoms, right? Not you seem to be off, you know, you're not yourself. No, no. You're standing at the sink washing dishes for three hours. You haven't been to work in the last three days. You seem to be really scared and you've got all the windows covered so that, you know, it looks like you're really scared about the, of the outside world. Specific symptoms. And uh, on that, uh, and, and to be prepared that you are possibly going to have a reaction. This is what scares a lot of people off. It's the anticipation of this that scares you off. You have to go in and be prepared to tolerate uh, some friction. And you have to be prepared for that friction to not scare you away permanently. The biggest mistake when I see, you know, when families come to consult me about, you know, the family member and I say, well, what have you tried? Well, you know, we tried, we tried. Well, you know, we tried once and he blew up and that was the end of it. That was the last conversation we had about it. So there are many different approaches. I go over a number of them in the book. I'll mention a few today. But, but to go back and revisit the issue, to stay on theme, to be relentless, not in an overwhelming way, but to be persistent in these efforts. And that means you have to be prepared to tolerate things. And that may be it's one of the reasons why you may want to go and consult somebody like me yourself, because what I do in uh, a lot of these consultations, they're, they're often not a one-time thing. Sometimes they, you know, we'll be meeting for months and I'll be doing a, a lot of hand-holding to try to help the helper to bear and tolerate the reactions that are going on without losing his or her nerve. Uh, so that's very important. It's definitely avoid buzzwords and stigmatizing words, crazy, sick, abnormal. Do not suggest the diagnosis. The goal of this is to go to somebody who has experience thinking systematically through, could it be this, could it be this, could it be that, asking, I mean, for me to figure out what's going on with the patient when I evaluate a patient takes me two and a half hours. Two and a half hours, in my opinion, that is a robust, complete psychiatric evaluation. It may involve looking at records, it may involve interviewing other family members that I t tell people to bring along with them. Uh, so there's a lot of information to be gathered so that I can figure out is it this or not that, is it that or not this. So what we call in the biz the differential diagnosis, all the different possibilities, what's most likely, do I need to get some tests in order to narrow things down. That's a very complex process. So don't be telling your loved one, I think you're an alcoholic. Uh, I think you have schizophrenia. I, I think you're bipolar. By the way, the most misused word in our society. Every little mood swing these days is bipolar. Uh, boy, boy, bipolar has gotten way out of hand. We can talk about that this afternoon if you'd like. Uh, it's a whole other lecture. Uh, here's a tip. Here's a particular method that has worked on a number of times. Here's a secret, secret uh, tool of mine. And that is ask for an evaluation as a gift. Uh, our anniversary is coming up is something I want from you that's more precious than anything you can buy in the store. I would like for you to come with me to have an evaluation for your sleeplessness and the way that you're drinking and so forth. So asking for a gift. And if you're in treatment, share your own experience. I was reluctant at first. Boy, did I put up a resistance to fight. But I came through and I've gotten treatment and it's made a huge difference in my life. You know, it's a great apple. I want you to have a bite of it too. And as I said, it may take a few tries. So what you're pitching is one and only one thing, and that is a one-time evaluation. Maybe starting with the primary care provider. We'll talk about that in a second. You can offer to make the appointment. I'll make the appointment with you. I'll go with you. You can even offer, okay, let's get money off the table. I'll pay for it. I will pay for it if you can. That is often a very significant barrier reducing maneuver. I've seen that work a number of times. And ask if you could go along, even if it's just to sit in the waiting room, to be a support, to be a comfort. And of course, you know, if you and the doctor want to ask me some questions, I'll be available. But to go to drive, to process it, 
with you. All right, now sometimes these conversations just between you and another are not enough. And you need to bring in other allies. And there are many other allies, and I go through a lot of these examples in the book. Uh, siblings, uh, clergy, uh, my wife's a clergy woman, can be very, very effective. Uh, coaches, peer support, I'm learning a lot about peer support last night, thanks to Brandy. Um, support groups, uh, very often uh, people who come to consult me, I write on my prescription pad for the family, attend NAMI, attend NAMI's family to family course. It's a tremendous amount of wisdom in those rooms. If you are in treatment, brainstorm with your own psychiatrist. Lord's no, Lord knows my patients do. Okay, so now I'm feeling better. My sister has the same kind of issues that I do, or even worse. How can I convince her to, again, get, get a bite of the same apple? Suggesting books or movies or memoirs. Uh, all right, so we saw that people are most likely to go to family and friend. The second most likely place they're willing to go for help is the primary care doc. The primary care doc really oftentimes has an established relationship. Uh, sometimes for years with a person. So consulting, if there is one, the family doc who knows your relative and uploading that information to their doctor and saying, can you help them, uh, is a starting point. As a matter of fact, about 80% of all psychiatric problems in this country are not treated by psychiatrists or social workers or psychologists. They're treated by primary care people. Uh, the 80% of all psychiatric medication is prescribed by primary care docs, not psychiatrists. Number one, there's not enough of us to go around. And number two, you know, most cases don't need a specialist. Just like most cases of hypertension can be treated by a primary care doc, it's very rare you need to go see the cardiologist or the nephrologist for it. All right, now, as I said, the heart and soul of uh, my message is this. Uh, which is how to use the often untapped power inherent in families. Uh, and this is a lot of the work that I do. Uh, it says in Alice in Wonderland, a word means what I want it to mean, nothing more, nothing less. So I'm talking about the word coercion. Uh, and you can call it caring coercion or therapeutic coercion or assisted treatment or tough love. But being able to utilize the power in families sometimes is necessary to go beyond rational conversations because uh, the fact of the matter is that when there's reason, there can be persuasion. Persuasion needs the traction of reason to be able to go. But as we all know, there are some more serious illnesses that diminish reason. And therefore, persuasion will no longer have uh, the ability to be effective. So instead, it has to be replaced by coercion. Not the coercion of the state, not the coercion of the doctor, but the power of family. So uh, in purpose of that coercion is not to enslave people or not to diminish their dignity, but actually the purpose is to restore reason. So it's a specific kind of coercion with a specific intent and a reason in uh, restoring coercion. So what am I talking about? There's a lot of talk about rights and everybody has rights in our culture, but in families, the word rights really needs to be replaced by the word privileges. And that family life involves many privileges, whether it's the privileges in, inherent in childhood or the privileges that adults give to one another, uh, whether they're spouses or parents of adult children. So, with privileges uh, come responsibilities. And in fact, responsibilities engender privilege. So responsibilities uh, may include things like taking care of your own health, being able to get a problem checked out, taking medication if that's necessary. Those are some of the responsibilities of adult life and of family life that give rise to privilege. So being able to uh, think about what privileges may be at stake is a very significant amount of uh, work that I often do with people, uh, with families who are dealing with a family member that has diminished uh, autonomy, diminished, re diminished reason. And we utilize things like cell phones, computer and internet access, 
You know, you want the password to the modem? You like to play video games? Okay, so I will type in the password to the modem after you've gone with me to have this evaluation. Or, doctor, put you on medication? Every day I change the password until you take your med that day, and then I'll open up the modem and type in the password and you can play. I've done that about seven or eight times, and it's worked. Car insurance, gas, subsidies, if your spouse making dinner, laundry, uh, vacations, paying for apartments uh, for grown-up children, even sometimes, especially in a marriage, as a last resort, the relationship, or, uh, and by the way, Aristophanes in 411 BC wrote this play, Lysistrata, in which the Trojan women decide it's time for the Trojan War to end. And we got to make our men stop fighting. How do they do that? They decide to withhold sex until the men quit the war. 2,000 year old solution, still viable. And, and as a last resort and with careful guidance, it's a risky thing, but sometimes it's got to be done to go from being Robert Frost who says, Home is the place where, when you have to go there, they have to take you in to instead being Tom Wolfe, that you can't go home again. So even the home. And I've had a few people who've had to spend a few nights on the street until they cry uncle. Very rare, risky, but not something to do without from professional support and handholding. And then finally, in the most significant circumstances, we have involuntary evaluation. Many of you in this room know as much about this as I do, you've been involved. It's always the, the bugaboo that we're dealing with these two words, imminent and danger, and sometimes gravely ill. And I, I don't need to review for this audience these uh, conundrums about these definitions and the way these definitions end up in real life being deployed by judges and uh, defense attorneys and prosecutors when it comes to uh, dealing with uh, situations that involve involuntary evaluation where the power of the family and all the allies and all the coercions just isn't enough and it's too risky a situation and you have to go for involuntary treatment. So I have a whole, uh, I'm not going to go through this just to give you a visual, a whole flow chart uh, about the whole in, uh, involuntary evaluation process just to make it clear, including the involuntary administration of medications uh, and how that's done. And, uh, how that's allowed. And a variety of tips uh, that I go through in the book uh, about how you can maximize the outcome. There's often a lot of disappointment. Uh, I've been through hundreds of involuntary commitment hearings. I used to co-direct the Treatment Resistant Psychosis Disorders Unit at Shepherd Pratt. So we had a lot of involuntary admissions there. And I went to court hundreds of times and worked with families and got them to give just the right kind of testimony to, make, to allow the judge to retain the person in the hospital. I've advised families who br bring people to the emergency room, what do you say to the ER doc? So that the ER doc is less likely to say, well, we're going to send them home. Um, a whole idea of if there's a legal problem, that could actually end up being a bonus. Could give you another entree into mandating certain things like treatment uh, in lieu of legal punishments, uh, even consider initiating a legal problem uh, if there's not. So Emerson famously said, it's one of the most beautiful compensations of this life that no man can sincerely try to help another without helping himself. So I have that quote to remind me that sometimes you may be part of the problem uh, inadvertently, inadvertently. The fact of the matter is, is one of the sometimes uh, uh, unexpected consequence of love is enabling. Uh, sometimes you may be part of the problem because of your own mental issues and emotional issues and psychological issues, maybe making things worse without you realizing them. But enabling is an especially common one that really uh, happens generally inadvertently. So. Um, how many of you are now into the new spin-off from Breaking Bad, Better Call Saul? Uh, nobody's, a couple people have seen it yet. Okay, so here, this, this is just last Sunday's episode uh, where uh, 
this, uh, our main character, his brother, is very severely mentally ill and finally got into the hospital, the physical hospital. And they're wanting now, finally there's an opportunity to commit him. Jimmy, in my opinion, Charles should be committed for 30 days of psychiatric observation. As a family member, you can submit a petition for him to be evaluated. There's an excellent facility in Las Cruces. He can be there tomorrow. I'm, I'm the one doing the heavy lifting here. That white gas he was talking about? Who do you think brings him that? And milk and bread and toilet paper and ice and every other damn thing he needs. Is that helping or enabling? You have the power to help your brother. Truly help him. Ignoring this won't make it go away. <sighs> Untie him. I'm getting him out of here. The nurse will bring you the release forms. Unfortunate, but I guess there have to be a few more episodes. <clears throat> we'll see what, what happens. Uh, the, uh, Andrew Solomon, uh, one of the great mental health journalists of our time, finally got an opportunity to interview Adam Lanza's mother, uh, uh, not, not mother, father, about Adam Lanza's mother and the situation. And uh, one of the things that really c comes out is how spellbound Nancy was by her son, how utterly powerless she became, how alone she became. Uh, how she, she, it was a bewildering degree of powerless. He says, Nancy's mixture of hovering appeasement and disregard for professional help now seems bewildering. So if I could do one thing and go back before Sandy Hook, I would want to see Nancy. I would want to get Nancy to come to support groups. I would want to get Nancy to take family to family. I would want to hold Nancy's hand by helping her brainstorm and cycle through a number of ideas. Um, because ultimately, this is what success really looks like. It is not a straight line. So in the end, what happened with the president and his wife? It was my suggestion that you get counseling and had I known then, I never would have said a word. Claire, please. Counseling was a godsend. Garrett and I needed help, and it's made things better. I should be thanking you. Trisha and I have been blessed with a strong and loving marriage. But even strong marriages face challenges. Like millions of Americans, we sought counseling from a spiritual advisor, one who happened also to be a professional therapist. Over the years, we have often turned to our faith, in times of adversity. Many have criticized us. But would you rather have a president that doesn't ask for help? I wouldn't. Asking for help is absolutely critical, but it doesn't always happen. Even though sometimes a president has to do it. That means you all, with those people that you care about, have to get that to happen. Um, I don't have time, but every author has the dream that his or her book will be made into a movie. My book was, but they just didn't know it. Um, <laughs> and um, ra rather than, uh, we're finishing right on time, if you're interested, I could show this this afternoon. It's about f a four minute clip of Meryl Streep and uh, Tommy Lee Jones have a marriage that is dying on the vine and Meryl Streep decides they need therapy and the crusty old Tommy Lee Jones will have none of it. So she gradually, by a variety of techniques that are all right out of my book, <laughs> convinces him uh, to get marital counseling. And uh, it's just a wonderful, humorous uh, and very compelling illustration about a variety of ways, the variety of paths that you need to continue to persist in. So I look forward perhaps to answering more of your questions and talking about whatever you want in this afternoon's session. Thank you very much.